Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello, I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today, we'll be exploring the life and work of the great British writer, novelist, philosopher, Colin Wilson. With me is Gary Lockman, who is the author of Beyond the Robot, The Life and Work of Colin Wilson. In fact, Gary is in many ways similar to Colin Wilson in that he's written many, many books now on various esoteric subjects, including biographies of Helena Blavatsky, Rudolf Steiner, Alistair Crowley, P.D. Uspensky. He's written about her medicine and Swedenborg and uh, the power of imagination. In some ways, Gary is carrying on the mantle of Colin Wilson, who was a great inspiration to him. The interview is being conducted via the internet, and now I will switch over to the other channel. Welcome, Gary. It's a pleasure to be with you once again. And I think this discussion we're about to have about the life of Colin Wilson is more personal for you than uh, probably any of your other books uh, or most of your other books. He, he had a, uh, role, a responsible role in shaping the kind of writer that you've become over the years. Well, that's absolutely true, Jeffrey. And uh, once again, thank you for having me on. Oh, well, I mean, the, the main difference, I would say, um, between you know writing about Colin Wilson and writing about the other people is that I, I, I knew Colin um, mm -hmm. and I went out of my way to know him. Um, I mean, I first came across his book, The Occult, which, um, I mean, all cliches aside, actually did change my life. Mm. Uh, when I was living on the Bowery in New York in 1975, and I had more or less just started playing in uh, uh, Blondie. Uh, this was Blondie before anybody knew um, who uh, Blondie was. Uh, and um, I was started playing with them a couple months earlier. Mm -hmm. And we had recently moved into, um, when I say we as Debbie, Harry, um, the singer, and Chris Stein, the guitarist, and myself, I had been living with them previously uh, for a while in this tiny flat Debbie had in Little Italy in New York. And we... Uh, found this space on the Bowery. And this was back when the Bowery really was the Bowery. If you go to New York today, it's all souped up and it doesn't look anything like it did in 1975. Um, but this was sort of an illegal space and there was this flamboyant uh, artist fellow who um, was controlling it and he lived on one floor and he rented us a floor and there was another fellow in it as well. But um, he was really interested in Alistair Crowley. And um, he was into Crowley's Tarot, and he used to do paintings on on Crowley's Tarot. And 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 Chris and Debbie, they had a kind of kitschy sort of pop interest in in the occult. They had some you know upside down pentagrams and voodoo dolls and things of that sort. And Debbie used to throw the I Ching and all that kind of thing. But um, there was sort of debris from the previous generation, kind of the late '60s generation, when the occult was you know uh, very much a part of popular culture, and it wasn't so much exactly then. Um, at least not in music uh, mm -hmm. at that time and, and, and that where we were. But I, I would see this stuff around and in conversations with um, this fellow at the loft, I got very interested in it. And one of the books I came across was uh, just a book just called The Occult and it was by Colin Wilson. And it was some beat up copy that had cigarette burns in it and had, had been through the mill and all that. It was a and, very thick book as I recall. Yeah, well, no, it was quite big. It was, it was a, you know, sort of five, 600 page uh, tome. Yeah. And um, I had no interest in The Occult before this other than sort of horror films you know 1930s and 40s horror films or hp lovecraft and weird tales sort of uh, pulp fiction sort of thing and um but w what interests me about this book was that wilson was writing about it from the sort of perspective of existentialism and and philosophy and i had read you know sartre and camus and nietzsche and, and all that sort of thing um already and so i knew those names and this interested me and it just was such a good read mm -hmm. uh, he, he was just such a, a fantastic narrative style where i just didn't want to put it down and it was idea after idea and sort of story and, and things building up and gradually this whole history about our hidden powers and our the 
evolution of consciousness and how when previously we you know had sort of the same kind of connection to nature that animals have that we we outgrew that and developed our rational mind but in doing that we had marginalized these other powers and then there were sort of further kinds of powers you know sort of the difference between sort of infrared and ultraviolet he talks about and these sort of evolutionary drive and and people like Gurdjieff and Uspensky and Crowley and Madame Blavatsky and, and Jung and all this stuff was in there and just was incredible. So I just became completely uh, bowled over by it. And and at, at that point, I just started reading everything I could get uh, about the occult. Uh, I mean, I got very interested in Crowley at this point, but also chasing down all of all of Wilson's books. Um, and uh, that carried on you know throughout the whole time when i was with blondie uh and then later on when I, I had my own group in los angeles in new york and then even when i was in the last time when i was playing in music and i was uh, a guitarist on two tours with um, the Gee pop in, in 1981 and at every, every town we went to i would run off to anywhere that had a bookshop not every town did but and, and, you know <laughs> sort of the places where you think there might be some used books or something like that and you'd find some of these things and i'd just be picking up all of these books of his and and finding him all, all over so no it was a com complete complete change and uh in my life and like I gave up doing music in the early 80s after this uh, sort of tenure with Iggy Pop. And um, in 1983, with um, a friend of mine, um, we went on this kind of mini search of the miraculous uh, in this European journey from Los Angeles to Europe. And we places like Chartres Cathedral and Notre Dame and I was reading old books about alchemy and how, you know, and the figures in the Gothic cathedrals, there's alchemical sort of uh, secrets and so on. And places like Glastonbury and, 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 and even we even tracked down um, uh, the location of Gurdjieff's um, Institute for the Harmonious development of man that was in Fontainebleau outside of Paris because at this time myself and, and my friend we were involved in the in the Gurdjieff work um, but on, on a sort of uh, solo part of this journey I, I made a pilgrimage down to uh, Cornwall where Wilson had um, been living he had moved down there in the mid 50s um, and uh, sort of you know presented myself down there and um, got to know him and carried on a friendship um, meeting up going there and he visited me in the states and when i've lived in london now for quite some time and whenever he would come up to do interviews or something like that we would meet and um yeah for about 30 years until his death in, in 2013 so yeah it was a very personal um relationship uh i mean it wasn't unique and many other people he was very open and i through knowing him, I met other people who are, you know, great uh, devotees of his work. But he certainly was a mentor uh, for me and uh, certainly someone um, who, uh, yes, if I have any kind of readable style in writing, it's from reading and rereading and rereading um, one of his books. Uh, because, as I say, he just has this fantastic narrative mm -hmm. style. And that's something I've tried to, you know, approximate in, in some small, mm -hmm. some small degree. Well, for our viewers who may not be familiar with uh, Colin Wilson's work, I, I suppose as a starting point, it's fair to say that he's one of the most prolific writers ever in the English language. Oh, certainly, certainly up there. I mean, um, he's he's written over a uh, hundred books, um, probably over one hundred and fifty, I think, and. I mean, at one point, I even asked him if he intended to outright H.G. Wells, because H.G. Wells also wrote, you know, an enormous number of, of, of books. And Colin said he wrote um, uh, the, the same way that a dog scratches fleas. He just couldn't help himself writing. Mm -hmm. um, but he started, you know, very young. I mean, his his first book, um, Outsider, which is the one that he's most known for, I would think, uh, perhaps with the occult, um, came out in 1956 when he was 24 years old. And um, he literally became a star overnight. He was an overnight success. Uh, he woke up one morning and he was actually famous across the land and very soon famous in, in Europe and in the United States. And um, which is remarkable in itself, because if you consider The Outsider, it's a book about sort of alienation and extreme mental states and um, these sort of geniuses who are driven to suicide or to sort of strange, you know, uh, dangerous ways of living and, and um, mysticism and all this sort of thing, which you wouldn't think would be on the summer, um, you know, bestseller list. Uh, it came out in late May of, of, as I said, 1956. But he was picked up in this whole publicity um, uh, movement and, and sort of storm uh, that was called the Angry Young Men. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and this was uh, people like John Osborne, um, who's famous for his first play, Look Back in Anger. And this was, this was the beginning of what was known as the kitchen sink kind of school of drama. I guess in the States, Tennessee Williams is sort of like that, but it's not, not quite the same thing. But it's all about, you know, everyday life, living in these tiny flats someplace. And uh, it, yeah, the kitchen sink is in there. So all the stuff that was out of all the kind of, uh, you know, drawing room, middle class drama or the romantic drama is like, you know, in your face. But Wilson came from a working class uh, background. He grew up in a, a working class family in Leicester in, in the Midlands of a very industrial area of, of, of uh, England. Uh, but his own concerns are much more existential, much more spiritual, and even religious at, at, in his early age. So he really didn't have much in common uh, aside from the working class background with people like Osborne and Kingsley Amos, John Brain, and some of the other people who were much more socially conscious. And it was, uh, they, I mean, there's they're sort of associated with the beat generation, but it's not quite the same thing. The beat generation was a bit wilder and, and more out there on the fringe. And the angry young men were much more sort of um, shaking their fists at the state and, 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 and the, the, you know, the failures of the welfare system and, and this kind of thing. But Wilson wasn't interested in that at all. I mean, the, the outsider is about these characters um, who um, are sort of driven by this intense need for a kind of sense of purpose, a kind of sense of meaning, and and uh, a, a, a intensity of experience that the the modern world just doesn't offer them, and he sort of says, you know, in the Middle Ages. Um, uh, you had the monasteries and, and the church. It was still a viable place for um, these sort of figures to go to, and they could find a home more or less in it. Whereas today, there's no place for them in the modern world, which is all geared towards sort of material comfort and high standard of living and so on. And while we've achieved that, um, in the process of doing that, we sort of dampened and, and numbed our, our kind of spiritual um, uh, ideals and, and values. But these characters, the outsiders, who they find themselves outside the everyday society precisely because they, they can find no place for it. And they're not just social misfits. I mean, they're not just, you know, the beatniks kind of thing. They're not just sort of the people who can't find a place in society. They can't find a place because they have this intense need for a, a, a sense of purpose and meaning uh, that everyday life can't give them. And so the book is just tells the story of the, these different characters and it, it's a very incongruous mix you have people like Nietzsche I mentioned Wells and Jean-Paul Sartre and Camus uh, Vaslav Nijinsky the the famous dancer who said God is fire in the head and um, many many others mm -hmm. and, and Wilson sort of separates them into three different types there's the intellectual outsider and then there's the sort of the emotional and the physical and Nijinsky is the physical one so he achieves this kind of ecstasy uh, through body and, and, and dance and movement but he's very weak in the mind and uh, we know he went he went mad um, and uh, someone like Van Gogh uh, the painter Van Gogh is this emotional outsider, has tremendous emotional power. He can transform, you know, he, he, a starry night, he can turn it into this vortex of, you know, power and beauty. Uh, but, you know, he also has these emotional storms that leads to his suicide. And someone like T.E. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia, um, is this uh, uh, intellectual outsider. Who's, who has this fantastically lucid and, and, and incredibly critical analytical mind, but he feels completely detached from life. And, and he commits a kind of slow suicide. And they, they all sort of face different challenges. And, I mean, it's incredible because this is something that Wilson was thinking about for like a decade before. I mean, if you uh, – I, I tell his – early story in the book and he writes uh, about his 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 youth um uh sort of from adolescence uh, until sort of the outsider breaks when he 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 had he, he sort of he lived as a tramp he went from job to job he was constantly trying to um not give in to the sort of the pressure to sort of conform to things and also but again not even so much society and because he's it's all it's this in a sense, it's religious because it's all about himself. He's more concerned about his own weaknesses and his own kind of uh, indolence and all that kind of thing. So in many ways, he sort of lives as an ascetic. Um, he tells this fantastic story about how he slept up on Hampstead Heath, and that's not too far from where I live, and it's this wonderfully wild expanse of you know natural land that's at sort of the north of London, and you can, you can get lost in it. It's quite big. And this is back in the 50s, though, but to save money so that he wouldn't have to work all the time and he could devote himself to writing. Um, what he did is that he slept in a waterproof, um, you know, sleeping bag up in the, up in the heath. And then he would, in the morning, he would cycle down, um, cause it's sort of a downhill cycle down into sort of central London to go to the British Museum and there, 
what, there was what they called the reading room. It, it isn't there anymore. Um, but this was this sort of library kind of within the British Museum. Mm-hmm. And people like Marx and Wells and Bernard Shaw and Carlyle and all these, you know, incredible figures of literature would, would spend their afternoons there or mornings reading. And Wilson, he would go and he would spend his day writing. And, and uh, he, was, uh, he was writing his first book, Ritual in the Dark. Which is still, it's a, it's a fantastic novel. It's a, it's, it's a great London novel, but it's sort of, uh, best understood as, uh, Jack the Ripper meets the brothers Karamazov in, in 1950s sort of, uh, you know, um, bombed out, uh, London. So he has this fantastic story of actually being one of the characters that he writes about. And it's, it's this incredible rags to riches story because when he finally comes to write The Outsider, and um, the first publisher he sends it to says, yes, I'll publish this. And he only sends him half the manuscript. And then he finishes the rest of it. And then, uh, as I said, he wakes up one morning. And uh, like Lord Byron had uh, found himself one morning in the previous century, all the all the land was, you know, resounding with his name. And his t- the book is getting fantastic reviews in all the best newspapers. And he's you know, on the radio and television and all this kind of thing. And he can't believe it. But... It's a rags to riches, almost back to rags mm-hmm. story because not so, not too long after this, this whole bubble about the angry young men and um, the, these kind of young geniuses, these sort of messiahs of the milk bars uh, that they recall. So, uh, you know, there's even younger. Wilson was 24. Somebody published a book. He was 23. So in a way, it was kind of like rock and roll. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and again, Wilson became a figure around the same time as uh, Presley, Elvis Presley was, and people like Marilyn Monroe. So he, uh, he was kind of in that world he was in the newspapers at the same time and this was a time when these writers were considered as you know punks in many ways there's in the book i beyond the robot uh, life and work of colin wilson i make parallels between what was happening in the punk era in the sort of 70s with what happened in wilson the angry young man because it was the same kind of thing where there were these kind of you know very uh ragged extreme transgressive characters who would say outrageous things and the and the journalists would try to get them to do that and same thing as they tried to do with the sex pistols and johnny rotten and all that but wilson you know was caught up in all that and of course you're a young man this is going to go to your head and all that kind of thing but he really was more serious in this and then when um the tide turned and the press, now they were getting a lot of um, selling out of papers attacking the angry young men. And they specifically went after him and they just, you know, considered him somebody who just quoted a lot from other people's books and put them together and this kind of thing. And he went from being, you know, like he was in Time magazine as, you know, sort of genius, you know, you know, whatever, to a, 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 a sort of cracked egghead or something like that. You know, mm-hmm. uh, he, he was considered, you know, oh, this, oh, this was a fraud that now, you know, um, we can, you know, forget about Wilson. And that was, you know, that was something that probably could have sent a couple of the outsiders he wrote about off the edge and, you know, and, and they, you know, blown their brains out. But he had a tremendous strength and endurance and a basic attitude like, no, uh, you're not going to stop me. I've already been doing this for 10 years on my own, writing in my mm-hmm. journals and all this kind of thing. So I've been doing this. I know I'm a genius. Sadly, he said that perhaps a bit too often in, in interviews, and the Brits don't like that. The Brits mm-hmm. don't like if you if you actually know how good you are, and you're certainly not supposed to tell anybody. <laughs> and he was breaking all those kind of social rules. And again, he was mm-hmm. he was out re- literally an outsider. He came from the Midlands. He didn't go to Cambridge. Didn't go to Oxford. Total work working class. Total autodidact and all that kind of thing. No college but, education at all. No college. No, no, no. He left school um, fifteen or sixteen or something like that. He he bummed around, did all these day jobs. You know, mm-hmm. um, uh, you know, uh, worked as a navi, basically a day laborer doing whatever, pickaxing, digging mm-hmm. ditches, and all that kind of thing. All this sort of different stuff. He was in the RAF for a while. Um, you had to do sort of mandatory kind of thing. Mm-hmm. He hitchhiked over to Paris back in the day when you know it wasn't the Euro star you had you know it actually was a bit of an effort to get there bummed around in france he sort of bummed around in paris and um you know met a young george plimpton when he was first starting sort of the paris review um other writers around at the time beckett and so he's in that world you know he mm-hmm. was in this world as, as this young guy young man convinced of his own brilliance and had these ideas and then his book comes out and then he establishes himself and then it basically moves out of London and goes down to Cornwall, where I met him in, eight, in 1983. Uh, this is about 1957, around there, mm-hmm. with his with his uh, girlfriend, uh, later his wife, and he hunkers down and he just keeps writing. 
Mm-hmm. I can attest that uh, growing up in Wisconsin in the 1950s, uh, we we didn't own a lot of books, but The Outsider was in our library. So I was exposed to his writing as a child. My mother must have uh, picked it up. I don't think my father would have, but um, he was an influence on me, uh, you know, at the age of 10. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got to him earlier than I did. Um, I, I think I came across that one. Maybe I was about 20 or something like that. But mm-hmm. no, he's one of – Outside is one of those books that um, everybody read at a mm-hmm. certain time, a certain generation. And even if you didn't read any of his other books, yeah. that was one that people read. It was in, in that kind of realm as like, you know, the Beats and um, – well, I was going to say Herman Hesse, but actually Wilson was responsible in many ways for reintroducing Hesse to English readers because – uh, along with all the other people I mentioned in The Outsider, he talks about Hesse, and Hesse's novels had been translated and been read, but he wasn't really read in the English-speaking world in, in the 50s um, mm. at all. And um, Wilson, ha- I think, if not the first, if one of the first really long uh, exposition um, of the you know the novels uh, and, and, and uh, in a book in which he's doing the same thing with Dostoevsky and something like that. Mm. And somebody else that... Um, Wilson talks about in The Outsider that uh, was would later become very popular was Gurdjieff. Mm-hmm. I mean, Gurdjieff uh, had only died maybe about six or seven years uh, b- before he was writing it. Um, Uspensky maybe a year or two before that. And there was just very little written about Gurdjieff that wasn't coming from people who were involved in the circles, involved with the groups and all that. And Wilson had come across Uspensky's In Search of the Miraculous when, um, at, at the Wimbledon Library. I mean, he was living in some room out there. He was always living in some room in all these different parts of London, uh, you know, because he was going from cheap room to cheap room. But he, he came across his book and, he, you know, uh, and he got to know uh, one, uh, well, he got to know two. He got to know Kenneth Walker, who was one part of the Uspensky's group in London, and he wrote a few books about it. But he also got to know J.G. Bennett, um, who's, who's better known, mm-hmm. uh, who had this whole school, Sherborne, um, in, in the 70s, and people like Robert Fripp from King Crimson and, and other people were involved in it and went there and so on and so on. Uh, so, but um, no, Wilson, I mean, he, but he was one of the early ones outside of the sort of Gurdjieff circle writing uh, at length about it in this book in the context of people like Nietzsche and, and, and Sartre and, you know, all, all the Bernard Shaw and all this sort of thing. So um, he was very much ahead of his time in, in many ways. Somebody else he wrote about early on that became immensely popular later was Alistair Crowley. Another another one was H.P. Lovecraft. He was writing about H.P. Lovecraft in the early 60s before the Lovecraft craze started a few years later. And there's still, you know, today, there's enormous kind of Lovecraft kind of, you know, pop culture out there and all that. So in many ways, Wilson was attuned to these things. Um, mm. But there was a long stretch when he really wasn't that well known. I mean, this was kind of the 60s. He even said to me, he sort of sat out the 60s. He really wasn't part of the 60s, kind of, although the outsider was, but what he was writing at that time uh, re- really wasn't part of it. So, and it wasn't really until kind of the, like I said, the sort of the occult revival in the late 60s, early 70s that he sort of became back into the popular mainstream again. Uh, he's regarded by some people as, as, as part of the angry young men group, but he had many issues, uh, with, with the main writers of that group. He was regarded as an existentialist. I think he still is regarded as an existentialist, but he took issue with Sartre and Camus and, mm-hmm. and the other prominent existentialists. I think what was unique about his writing is, to me, is, is the effort to look at esoteric culture and the occult and to integrate it with the humanistic philosophical tradition. Well, no, you're absolutely right. And I think this is one of the things. I mean, I, I first read The Occult. So that's how I was first introduced to him. And yeah. it was through that book that I was introduced to all the things that I've been writing about now for, you know, 20 something years. Um, but when I, started tracking down all his other books, especially The Outsider, then there's a whole sequence of books that's called The Outsider Cycle. Mm-hmm. There's a book called Religion and the Rebel, which was the second book, and that was completely trashed by the critics. Um, and then there's, there's a few others. And what he's trying to develop in these in these six books is what he calls a new existentialism. And and he, he was sort of Britain's own homegrown existentialist. I mean, um, the, the, the thing about... Great Britain is that they're not they're not particularly interested in the kinds of ideas that people like Sartre and Camus and Heidegger and what, what they call the continental thinkers. It's all too a bit willy minded for them, and they're very pragmatic and 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 utilitarian that kind of thing. So in a way, Wilson was kind of out of you know um, very much out of the 
normal English kind of uh, way of doing things in the first place, and that he was an autodidact. But he was very, you know, he was considered England's only, you know, homegrown existentialist. And he actually met Camus. Um, um, he visited him, um, spent an afternoon with him in Paris uh, once. But his 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 vision is that while while he appreciated, what we can say, the critical view mm -hmm. of people like Sartre and Camus and Heidegger, you know, this kind of uh, what Heidegger, Heidegger called in, inauthenticity, or Sartre called bad faith, the kind of illusions that we all um, kind of maintain in order to keep life kind of, you know, safe and comfortable for ourselves, and we're sort of, we're keeping at bay this kind of, you know, void or whatever, this dangerous sort of stuff. He, he, he didn't agree with their vision that, you know, the world is basically meaningless. I mean, um, for, for all three of them, mm -hmm. um, fundamentally, the, you know, the universe is meaningless, it's absurd, there's no God, there's no transcendent meaning or anything like that. And Wilson couldn't agree with that because he himself had had these moments of kind of tremendous sense of power, meaning, and purpose. But and he, he also didn't understand the depth of their alienation. Oh, no, of course. I mean, I mean, he went through it himself. Yeah. I mean, he, he had this miserable childhood. I mean, if you read about his childhood, you think, oh, my God, you know, I mean, I mean, um, I, 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 no, he just felt, you know, as soon as he became aware of the world, he just felt that human beings were so stupid. And no one really, everyone didn't, you know, they didn't, they cared about trivialities. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, they cared about these um, inconsequential kinds of things when there's this whole world around them that's just mysterious and strange. And he had this enormous desire to understand and know. And, and he was a brilliant kid, but he must have been, um, I guess today, he, you know, who knows, he would have been sort of, you know, I don't know, diagnosed as autistic or, or whatever. I, I, yeah. The pathology keeps changing all the time but i mean he, uh, he himself says that he was very you know uh, uh, very detached from the world he uh, he didn't understand human stupidity he, he didn't understand how human beings carry on in the face of something like infinity or not knowing you know where the universe ended or where time began or you know these kind of things that we all at some point question and you know most of us tend to say okay well yeah i can't answer that but you know maybe stephen hawkins can or or somebody else can but you know again wilson was one of these characters who they can't put that onto someone else. No. They feel this burning kind of desire. Well, no, I, I have to kind of figure this one out for myself. And he, you know, kind of went around to everyone around him and nobody had any idea what he was talking about, basically saying, calm down, kid, and, and that kind of thing. And this drove him out. And he even talks about at one point, uh, he thought, you know, life was so stupid and absurd that he refused to go on anymore. He, he, and he refused, he was, he, finding himself sort of going to the brink, you know, going to the, just mm -hmm. at the edge of the abyss, and then he would draw back, and then he was tired of that, and he's saying, no, I'm not going to let life trick me once more into carrying on, because it's all just this futility, very Schopenhauerian, you know, kind of view, this pessimistic view, everything was futile, we're just driven by these animal urges, and the clear-sighted, lucid mind refuses to do this, and, you know, prefers, you know, destruction. And he even t he tells the story about how when he was in um, a chemistry class, uh, and he decided to drink, um, I think it's sulfuric acid or hydrochloric acid or something, whatever, you know, something that'll, you know, do him in. And, um, he was there and he was, you know, had the smock on, was about to pick up the vial. And then he had a vivid, vivid sense of, you know, how it would feel drinking the acid. And his imagination kind of kicked in. And call it precognition or just call it his imagination, you know, working, you know, suddenly uh, full power. He just realized what he wanted was more life, not less. This is one of the most profound experiences of his life, the, the, oh, de I, 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 the decision not to uh, kill himself at that point by drinking some horrible acid. No, no, absolutely. This is it. He said he realized that what he wanted was more life, not less. Mm -hmm. And and um, so what you know, his revulsion from the life around him was um, not out of a desire for self destruction. It was a desire for something more, to something more than mm -hmm. what was there. And then he sort of basically went out went out after that. And what but, is that? And mm -hmm. had a very pow a powerful emotional response to it, and also. He devoted this kind of powerful, as I said, almost kind of, you know, I don't want to say autistic, but you know what I mean? This sort of obsessive analytical power to what, okay, what is that, you know? And then he had, you know, different people in, in the books he writes about, they too face these moments of suicide and they're drawn back. I mean, if you know Hess's novel, Steppenwolf, that's, that's what the Steppenwolf does. Harry Haller walks around, you know, trying to kill time and deciding whether to go home and slit his throat or not. And he has a glass of wine and he has this mystical experience. That, that, that renews life and suddenly he's 
the thing is, he's reminded of things he already knows, mm -hmm. but he really knows them. He knows them in italics, or this is what Wilson calls faculty X. It's faculty X because we don't have a name for it. And it's basically our grasp on reality. And what happens to these outsiders and all of us, but it happens to them more because they're more sensitive, is that they, they lose touch with reality and they become just completely entrapped in their own world and, and you know, slowly suffocate. And they throw themselves into absurd situations or dangerous situations just to suddenly feel alive again. And this is somehow Wilson realized that crisis has this ability to sort of, you know, wake us up again mm -hmm. and okay so that's one part of the puzzle crisis can do it well why does crisis do it? what happens when we're in this moment of crisis and that's like the next kind of part of the puzzle that he tries to analyze and the next step is is there a way for us to induce the same thing that happens when we face crisis without having to put a gun to our heads because literally some of the people he writes about like graham green the english writer did put a gun to their head and, and others as well you know they, they as I said they live dangerously in the sense that Nietzsche says, but not, you know, uh, Nietzsche says, build your houses on Vesuvius, but these people actually did. They went out of their way to do, mm -hmm. you know, things that normal human beings would consider to be, no, you don't want to do that. But they were doing it because they, they had some instinctive sense that throwing themselves into these kind of dangerous situations would reawaken their sense of life. Well, I suppose in, in our present era, a lot of people take drugs for that very purpose, or they yeah, engage in reckless activity. Yeah, uh, I have a, a brother who's something of a thrill seeker, and he loves to race motorcycles, for example. People do things to endanger themselves in order to feel more alive. Well, this is true, and you know, and it, it, it seems aberrant a uh, behavior, and and for the rational mind, it is. Um, <clears throat> but um, well, what Wilson says is behind this is there's something that he calls the robot, mm -hmm. and this is a kind of labor-saving device that human beings have developed evolutionarily, um, and basically, it's a kind of automatic pilot, and it takes over duties that where very uh, sort of laborious for us to sort of acquire in the first place, but the, the, the whole phenomena of like, yeah, I got it now, now I can do it. I can ride the bike now, I can type now, I can speak French now, whatever it is. That phenomena is when the robot takes over. That kind and, of robotic behavior is something that Gurdjieff also identified. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, Wilson had, had much admiration for Gurdjieff. He, he wrote about him in many books and in and, and a, and a small kind of introductory sort of biography as well. And he's one of the uh, figures that he's written about that he has many, and he even said to me once out of all the people that he wrote about, Gurdjieff have been, you know, one of the ones he would have, he would have liked to have met. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, very similar sort of thing. Gurdjieff talks about we're, we're mechanical and, mm -hmm. and we're asleep. And it's, it's the same phenomena. I mean, Wilson's sort he's just basically, he, he sees its source in something that we've developed over our evolution mm -hmm. because it actually, it is something we need to do because, you know, if, if you, Set you want to go out for a run, you, it, it's it'd be a real bother if you had to learn how to tie your your your, your sneakers mm -hmm. every time you wanted to do that. If you wanted to type a letter, it'd be a real bother to have to learn how to type mm -hmm. every time you want to do that. So we pass over that that process, you know, uh, of actually typing to mm -hmm. the robot or the mechanic mechanical mm -hmm. center, whatever you know system you want to use to talk about that, um, and that frees up some other part of ourselves and we can think about, okay, this is where I want to go on my run or this is what I want to write in my letter kind of thing. Mm -hmm. That's fine and dandy, but the problem seems to have been is that for some reason we have allowed the robot to take over more and more and more of our activities until it is doing things that we would rather do ourselves. In fact, I we somehow yeah. lost track of some, we don't know how to turn it off. I had the privilege of interviewing Colin Wilson back, I think, in the 1980s. In fact, I'll link to that interview because it is available on on YouTube. And, and I was really struck when he told me that he discovered to his horror that the robot was taking over while he was having sex with his wife. <laughs> Oh, well, poor, poor Joy. Uh, yeah, I'm sure she's heard that in more than one interview. Uh, yes, yes, yes. No, well, I'm, I'm almost tempted to say, well, look, you know, you needn't do interview me the rest of the <laughs> Just watch the interview you did with Colin. But yes, it's all this kind of thing. He said, yes, he, you know, he says it's something. So you, it's a piece of music that you love and you know you love it, but for some reason 
you know, uh, it just doesn't, you know, doing the same thing it used to do. And nothing's changed. Nothing's changed the Mozart Symphony or the Black Sabbath album, but you, 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 you have changed in some way or something like that. And all of his work is basically about understanding that sort of mechanism um, mm. and understanding how we can kind of, as we say, take over more of the tasks that we've given over to the robot. He, he, he's fond of quoting this line from T.S. Eliot where he says, where is the life we have lost in living? And then he said, well, it's in the hands of the robot. And we need the robot because, as you say, uh, to sort of feel the sense of intensity of life, we're often drawn to drugs or drink or something like that. And they can do that. But they, they do that at a price mm-hmm. because we lose our um, e- efficiency. We, we lose our will, basically. Yeah. One of the things that drugs or drink does is it sort of inhibits the will. It relaxes us. Um, suddenly, things that we looked at before that struck us as dull or neutral or uninteresting suddenly become more interesting because um, we, we put the robot to sleep and we can see these things are self fresh. But mm-hmm. that's why, you know, there's warnings don't, don't, use heavy machinery after you've had you know a few glasses of wine or don't drive a car because what usually will do that for us the robot he's 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 taking a nap so <laughs> you can have that freshness but you can't you can't be effective so is there a way to have both and it does seem to be because there are accounts of people who had these experiences where they've had that sudden vividness this this sudden sense of matchless clarity i mean the world you know heaven in a, in a flower mm-hmm. and all that sort of thing but they haven't you know, fallen into a swoon or they haven't, you know, become immobile. They're able to sort of act as well. And this is the kind of thing, this is what Wilson is sort of aiming at, to sort of have that um, freshness and openness mm-hmm. that we, we, we use crude methods to sort of get to now without having to resort mm-hmm. to those. But one of the interesting things that you write about is the relationship between Colin Wilson and the uh, great psychologist who was a big influence on me, uh, Abraham Maslow, and the notion of the peak experience. Maslow was one of the few people um, during sort of Wilson's kind of uh, period when he was, you know, sort of not a pariah, as, as it were, who who actually sought him out and recognized in his work, you know, important um, important things. And uh, there's a book um, called it was called The Age of Defeat in um, uh, the the UK, but it's a US title. Uh, the publishers wanted something more upbeat, and they called it The Stature of Man. And this is a book that Wilson wrote about the loss of the hero in, in contemporary literature. And again, this is the late 50s. So we're talking like Death of a Salesman or something like that, or as they say, like Tennessee William characters, where, um, you, you know, we're, in the 19th century, you had these, these titanic heroes like Ahab or, you know, Raskolnikov or Faust or something like that. And in the modern time, everyone's, you know, um, you know, an Kowal- anti-hero. You know, Stanley Kowalski in a t-shirt and, yeah. you know, uh, all that kind of thing. And this is the real and the same kind of thing with the angry young men. And Wilson is basically saying, well, this is a this this portrays human beings as rather small and limited and, and narrow and our, our concerns have got, you know, very, very, you know, small, banal, sort of mediocre. And this was something that Maslow himself had picked up on because he had um, come across something that he called the Jonah complex. Um, in um, sort of his studies, and Maslow was uh, Abraham Maslow was a, a psychologist. He started out as a Freudian, and um, he got tired of being a Freudian because he realized um, the only thing, only people he was meeting were sick people, um, and he, he wanted to study healthy people. And he realized there was no psychology about healthy people, and so he decided to study healthy people. And he came to a lot of interesting conclusions. And uh, but one of the things that he he, he saw in in his students was that they, they wanted to sort of kind of run away from any kind of destiny, the whole idea that they could be somehow better than, or, oh, I, you're not supposed to say better, but, you know, you, you had a full, you know, uh, completely actualized life in which you did your best and all that kind of thing. This was something that they didn't, you know, uh, they didn't even think about. It was just, just enough mm-hmm. to be average, just to be good enough, fit in, and all this kind of thing, this sort of diffidence. Maslow is, you know, uh, popularized the very notion of self-actualization. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things he's fam- famously said in one of these classes, he said, well, if not you, then who? If, if, if you are not going to excel in your field, well, who is? Who is going to? You know, who are these other people that are going to do that? And that kind of thing. But this, this avoidance of this is he called the Jonah complex when it comes in the Bible, where Jonah wanted to avoid his destiny. And, and he, you know, you ran away from God and went into the whale and all this kind of thing. And this is a kind of mythic, um, expression of this um, fear we have of our own abilities 
you know, we have this fear of, uh, of, our, of uh, we, we all have fear of failure, but we all have the kind of fear of success as well. And what he appreciated in Wilson's work is Wilson was sort of, you know, celebrating these, these characters, these characters who were larger than life. You know, they're, they're tragic. They're not, they, they, it's not all, you know, they're not all Pollyannish and everything works out in the end, but they're larger than life characters and they, they may fail, but they fail in some kind of titanic struggle. They don't fail in the sense of, you know, uh, Stanley Kowalski or something like that or and that kind of thing. And, uh, they developed a relationship and a correspondence. And one of the, ma- the central ideas that Wilson got from Maslow was this whole idea of the peak experience. And the peak experience is something that Maslow discovered in his studies of healthy people. And um, what the peak experience is are these just sudden, um, seemingly arbitrary moments of profound well-being and happiness and yay saying and contentment um, uh, and joy that um, came for no reason at all. And, you know, uh, and if you study these kinds of uh, moments that he talks about, um, the things that trigger them are the things that we see all the time. But for some reason, we don't have these experiences. And one of the ones he talks about where there was a Marine who was stationed on a base for, I don't know how long, whatever, a couple of years or something. And he hadn't seen a woman for a very long time. And then he went to another base where there were nurses and he saw a nurse walk by and he suddenly said, Wow, you know, women are different than men. I know you're not supposed to say that these days. I'm sorry. <laughs> he wasn't politically correct back then. But he had this sudden profound, you know, insight that, you know, women were this, you know, different, you know, being and, you know, radically different, all this kind of thing. And it's something that anybody who was on that base would have said, yeah, 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 whatever. What are you getting so excited about? But it suddenly struck him as, as something radically new and, 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 and fresh. And similarly, uh, he tells the story of um, a, 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 a woman who was uh, sort of getting her husband and children out, you know, in the morning to work and all that. And um, something she did every morning and, you know, many mornings was probably a chore and didn't really want to do it. But she suddenly had this sense of how happy she was mm-hmm. and how um, lucky she was. And it just kind of came to her. And this was something, and again, it's nothing transcendent in the sense of, of spiritual, in the sense of some kind of supernatural grace falling upon these people, is that somehow they see something they already know in this new light, in this new dimension, and they feel a sense of gratitude for it and all like that. And this was something that related to these kinds of experiences that Wilson was having himself, and also that he charted in people like Blake and Nietzsche um, and, and Uspensky and other people he was writing about. Uh, they had these sudden moments of affirmation. You know, Nietzsche, who had like the wretchedest life around. If you, if you ever <laughs> read about the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, read about his life, he was a sad, sad, tragic figure. He was sick all the time. He was the loneliest man in the world, all this kind of thing. And um, constantly moving around you know, Europe trying to find some place with a climate, you know, he could stay for a while. But he developed this philosophy of absolute affirmation, uh, where these, these moments of kind of profound well-being would overcome, uh, overcome him. Um, and he talks about when the inspiration for his book, Thus Spake Zarathustra, came to him. He said he was 6,000 feet above man in time and all this kind of thing. So you would think someone like Nietzsche, who had this absolutely wretched life, would have developed this philosophy of you know, pessimism and something like Schopenhauer. And strangely enough, Schopenhauer had a very nice, comfortable life, and he developed this horrible, <laughs> pessimistic philosophy that life is meaningless. So somehow having to struggle against this kind of suffering you know, in some way, uh, and this is something Maslow says as well. Mm. Somehow, adverse conditions, in many ways, are are preferable for self actualization than being nice, cozy, you know, comfy ones, because you need to sort of work against something. So, um, these kind of visions of meaning and affirmation—they're not—they're not transcendent. They're just sudden senses of yay saying. You know, um, th- these figures that. Wilson was writing about and the people that Maslow was studying, they were having similar kinds of things. So they had a lot in common. And Wilson's next step was um, Maslow said peak experiences can't be induced. They come, they go, they just happen. Wilson wasn't, no, he wasn't happy with that. He thought, well, actually, maybe we can make them happen. Um, not in the sense that let's go running after peak experiences, but let's try to analyze the mechanisms, what's happening in consciousness when something like a peak experience takes place. And this is, Wilson got very interested in the philosophy of a German philosopher named Edmund Husserl and this whole method called phenomenology, which is basically a kind of mapping out of what's taking place in consciousness. 
he, he spent much of his career actually looking at uh, higher states of consciousness and how uh, through very subtle shifts one one can enter into those higher states he uh, when I interviewed him he made a point of saying you know we're uh, when we get into that robot state we're just inside the robot state it takes only a, a, a tiny movement to get out of it well, this is one of the things he, he came to un- understand, and um, this was through this um, the work of this philosopher I mentioned, Edmund Husserl. And um, the, one of the fundamental insights that, that Husserl came to, and um, this was in the early early 20th century, late 19th, early 20th century, um, was that perception is intentional. Mm-hmm. And um, Wilson says in one of his books, uh, along with perceptions, we have a will to perceive. Now, we're not usually aware of any kind of will, you know, in us seeing the world. I close my eyes, I don't see the world, I open them, it's there. I'm, I'm, I'm a kind of, you know, mirror or a camera that just reflects what's there. And while that may seem the case on the surface of my consciousness, for Searle and Wilson and all these other people that he writes about, that he, he links these mm-hmm. ideas together, so there's a kind of canon yeah. And if you read Colin's works and you follow them, there's a whole canon of people whose ideas he's building on and he connects them together. Parenthetically, it's worth mentioning that Husserl was the mentor of uh, Heidegger. It began this philosophical sort of method called phenomenology, out of which uh, Heidegger was one of his students and out of that existentialism. And so the people Wilson was writing about, we were talking about earlier, like Sartre and Camus, they, they came out of this as well. And he would say that they, they misunderstood this fundamental idea of, of, of Husserl's, that perception is intentional. Mm-hmm. So at some fundamental, unconscious, deep level, which we don't have immediate access to, there's a kind of will to perceive. We, we are actually reaching out to, to, to perceive the world. So, um, uh, Wilson uses sort of the metaphor of a kind of, you know, shooting an arrow at the world. But another one I think is, is better. He says, like, in, instead of thinking of consciousness as a kind of a mirror that reflects things, it's a hand that reaches out and grabs them. We, we grab the world. And one of the, one of the examples he gives for this, um, uh, makes this clear to me. Uh, it, 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 there's two different, ver- a couple of versions of one is like, you know, in the old days when people had watches instead of their phones and they went to see what time it was. If you didn't really pay attention, your eyes picked up you know, the light and, you know, we saw what it was, but somehow inside you didn't retain what time it was and you had to go look again. So the, the actual perception happened, but you weren't intending enough to retain the, you know, so even on that level, or if you, you, you know, you're reading a book and your attention drifts, you might have read the words, you know, you, you, you absorb them in that sense, but you didn't retain the meaning. You, you, so you weren't able to. So we have this kind of interactive relationship with the wor- with the world, and this was something that com- comes out of phenomenology. And, and other people do the same kind of thing. Henri Corbin, in a different way, um, uh, he was a student of Heidegger's. He actually translated some. He was one of the early, first translators of uh, Heidegger into French. And and um, so in his own own work work with the imaginal world and all that, that's linked to phenomenology as well. But this whole idea that we sort of read the world. Um, and if you're not in the same way that if you're not intending enough, paying attention enough to what you're reading or, or seeing what time it is, and you don't really get it, if you just look at the world in this blank kind of stare, you're not going to get what's there either. Mm-hmm. So this is where he disagrees with Sartre and Camus and Heidegger, where they all basically say, no, the world is meaningless. We, we, we can't rely on any kind of meaning outside of the human one. But within this human world, we can, we can achieve this kind of stoic endurance. And you no, know, there's certain heroism in there. And there's a certain, you know, and Wilson's aware of that, but he just, he just can't let go of those moments when actually I, I perceive of the world when it was actually dripping in meaning and, and and in those sort of moments for some reason or other our intentionality increases in some way mm-hmm. or conversely the 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 the, the filters the, the robot that sort of keeps all that at bay so that we can get through life this is what happens with drugs and drink that the robot you know goes to sleep and then the meaning that's there comes comes flooding into us we don't necessarily we're not necessarily intending more but the the filters that prevent us from seeing the meaning and this is the difference he would say you know that kind of mystical experience yes we, we all love them you know we, we we go out of our way to experiencing them but he would say that's that's the kind of drift back into an earlier form of consciousness mm-hmm. we, we develop the robot we develop these filters we we developed this way of editing down reality to this bare minimum because we needed to in order to survive. We needed to in order to, you know, for better or worse, to prosper uh, as a species and all that. But 
we now understand enough about our own psychology to realize that, okay, we've done that to the extent that we've cut out this meaning that, you know, we need to let in now. And in a way, we intuitively know that's because we developed a kind of system, we call it art, um, to allow some of that meaning in. You know, um, the, the object of a work of art was supposed to be, in the old days, I would say, precisely to make us slow down so that we had to pay more attention to it and look at it longer and not just scan it. Now, what we do to get through the world is just scan everything. You know, we sort of, you know, as I say, you know, you don't need to know the make and model of the car that's coming down the road. You just need to get out of its way. But when you're not endangered by it and you're walking up the street and you see this, whatever, 1962 Mercedes something or other park there, and it's really interesting that you can look at it and all that, wow. But you don't need to know all that detail when it's something that's, you know, endangering you. So most of the time we're in that mode where we sort of reduce the world to this bare minimum in order to deal with it. And precisely because the reason we like drugs and drinks is that it turns that off and mm -hmm. things become interesting. So, but that's as I said, that's slipping back into an earlier form. And what Wilson wants to do is instead of turning the robot off, learn how, to, or putting it out of commission, learn how to turn it down a little bit, mm -hmm. which basically means learn how to turn you up yeah. more. And this, this is what you were saying is that the difference between robot and what he says, real you and robot is, is very, it's, 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 um, a fraction. It, 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 that, that's why these peak experiences can happen. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't happen to people that are mystics and you know practicing meditation. Old, I mean, they may, but I'm saying they're they're not aiming to do it. It happens in some way. These things happen naturally, and this is something. Again, this is part of the puzzle. This is a clue to his puzzle to how 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 can we learn to sort of basically how can we learn to use our consciousness in order to induce more consciousness. He became quite interested in the brain itself and the two hemispheres of the brain and uh, also Julian Jaynes' theory of the uh, bicameral mind. Yeah, this is true. This is true. And um, in the early 80s, um, and this is this is one this one time I actually I did so I met him in so far as I asked him to sign a book, but I was in London at the time in uh, January 1981 actually, and he was giving a talk about a book of his called Frankenstein's Castle, and it's a it's a thin book. And he wrote a couple books around this time. Another one is called Access to Inner Worlds. Well, yes, he became very interested in the left and right brain um, sort of story that was uh, going on at the time. And uh, Julian Jaynes idea, his book in Origins of Consciousness and the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind, uh, which again suggests, and even in his book, that earlier in, in our history, you know, many, many years ago, we didn't have the same kind of consciousness that we have now. You know, we don't, we didn't have the kind of clear, lucid, rational, there's me in my head here, and there's the world out there. We didn't have that. It was much more of a kind of continuum, um, much less of this kind of distinct separation. Mm -hmm. And um, But what Wilson found was that um, the it seemed that the kinds of experiences that he was charting, the peak experiences and mystical experiences, um, and the way in which the world seemed to be in them was something that seemed to be um, associated with the way in which the right brain kind of perceives the world. Yeah. And and the, the more limited view of things, uh, the edited down version, which we need in order to deal with the world, is something that was more associated with the left brain. And I tell you, one of the interesting things is that a great deal of the stuff that Colin wrote about in those two books and, and a few other books of his, uh, where he talks about the, the left and right brain, is a very, very important book that came out um, about 10 years ago now called uh, The Master and His Emissary by Ian McGilchrist, and, um, which is a much larger, you know, uh, more in-depth and, and uh, you know, sort of, uh, well, McGilchrist is a, a neuroscientist, and so it's much more sort of scientifically and academically kind of notated and all that. But many of the insights that McGilchrist talks about in that book, Colin had sort of talked about um, earlier. And uh, that suggests to me that, you know, in his own way, intuitively, or just looking at it from his own phenomenological approach, he had, um, you know, came upon many of the things that later, this is, you know, more than 20 years later, uh, at least for me, are kind of were being anchored in that book in, you know, in, in hard kind of uh, neurological evidence. So, um, but yeah, there was this, and he also, you know, he believed that the right brain was the source or the conduit or that part of ourselves that was associated with paranormal experiences mm -hmm. or occult experiences. Because as you say, I started out talking about the occult. Um, some 
people who have written about Wilson said, oh, well, he wrote these books about existentialism, and then he's kind of, he kind of hopped on the occult bag- bandwagon because there was the occult revival in the late 60s and a lot of books were being published about and all that. And in one sense, that's true. He was asked to write the book. Uh, a, a publisher you know, approached him and asked him to write a book about the occult. And he had had interest in it kind of vaguely. It turns up in some of his other novels. He had written a novel where Alistair Crowley was a character, and he wrote a book about Rasputin. And so it was something that had, you know, it was there, it was in his background, but he didn't take very seriously. But once he started writing the book, he realized that it was something that he had to take seriously. And as I said, he connected it to this decades-long exploration of existential philosophy and phenomenology. So it wasn't so much of a, you know, sudden jump from one thing to the other was a continuation and an opening up Mm -hmm. and then likewise from opening up from looking at occult and paranormal experiences and these mystical states of consciousness seriously to uh looking at them in the context of uh, the psychology of 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 the you know the hemispheres of the brain and all that and uh and one of the things about colin too is that he's not afraid to say he was wrong about something and to go back and change his mind. I mean, one of the things that he did that uh, sort of, I think, in some ways that may have affected some people's appreciation of his work was that he wrote a book about poltergeists in uh, the early 80s, where uh, he came to the conclusion that, well, even though my rational self was much rather... Uh, understand them in terms of something happening in the brain or the unconscious of an adolescent or something like that, the evidence seems to suggest that, no, there actually are spirits of some kind. They, they're, they're involved somehow with the you know the brain. They're involved with the unconscious of the person that's um, you know being troubled by them. But they have an objective entity uh, existence of their own. And this was something that you know he had to say. Well, you know, I'd rather not. But this is how it is. And mm-hmm. um, you know, you, you might think he's wrong and all that. But this was something that I think um, was admirable about him that he was willing to stick his neck out um, in this way and and talk about things that a lot of people at the time they just wouldn't have they wouldn't have done that. Mm-hmm. Toward the end of his career, he began exploring uh, uh, and actually not, uh, mapping out higher states of consciousness, uh, much in the way I think John Lilly uh, was doing around the same time. Uh, the follow-up to the occult was this wonderful book called um, uh, Mysteries. Mm-hmm. That um, again, this was in the late '70s, uh, and this he just carried on the research where the occult was a history, sort of going to the past. Mysteries was basically this is all the stuff that's going on now. So John Lilly is in there, and T.C. Lethbridge is in there, who did a lot of the work of pendulums and um, uh, megaliths and standing stone, and John Michelle, and so much other stuff. Uh, Robert Monroe, um, Gurdjieff, and uh, you know, so he just put everything together, and mm-hmm. uh, and as we said, uh, put it together in, in sort of a kind of working hypothesis about about um, the occult and the paranormal and all that. And then he mapped out what he called the ladder of selves, which was one of the um, metaphors that he used to understand. Well, he went through, he went through this period of um, in the sort of mid seventies when he was subject to these panic attacks. He talks about that's how he starts the, the book mysteries about, uh, and um, there were these sudden kind of just basic panics out of nowhere. And, and he couldn't control it no matter what you do. And he would go into being interviewed or do something like this, what we're doing now, and suddenly become incredibly self-conscious and, and not be able to do it. And this went on for a long time, and he didn't know what he was doing, what happened. He was going out of his mind or something. And he learned to somehow control it by understanding that there was sort of a more mature part of himself that he could somehow summon, again, a kind of mm-hmm. crisis kind of moment, a kind of sudden concentration. Because this is what the crisis does. The crisis makes us go, ah! And I'm doing that. That's what Colin did in practically all of his lectures. But you know, the, the crisis makes us do that. And by doing that, we kind of summon this energy. And we're basically saying to the robot, okay, this is serious. You know, you have to get out of the way for a while. Um, I, I have to be in control now. And so, you know, very similar, you know, this kind of um, – these panic attacks would force him to induce this kind of sense of himself being, you know, more in control. Uh, whereas the panic attacks were from a, a, a less mature self doing it. And um, – this was something he developed later on. I mean, one of the last books he worked on, um, is, I said, he, he, what you said earlier, the thing with Colin is he wrote so much, you know, you yeah. can, you could, you, you know, it's impossible to cover everything. We could talk for days. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but he did a book called Super Consciousness. Um, that something, it was something he wanted to do for a long time. It was kind of a DIY. And again, when Colin says DIY, basically it's understand the ideas. Mm-hmm. He, he, he isn't someone to sort of give you exercises, although he has a couple things like that. And so it isn't kind of like do this. It's sort of like understand this. Mm-hmm. I think this is one of the things that set him apart, um, where it was sort of 
it was it was a way of knowledge, but I don't mean it in some kind of you know spiritual new agey kind of way. It was basically understanding. This is why you know his roots are in philosophy, his roots are in existentialism, roots are in phenomenology. It's understanding how consciousness works, and this is what he did in this book called Super Consciousness, where he basically boiled down a lifetime's you know exploration of these things into a, a, a short book uh, that kind of dealt with the essentials. And I tell you. It, to, to try and say it now, uh, as, as you know, with as much brevity as possible, it may sound like a cliche, but what he fundamentally comes down to is um, a persistent, a, a persistent sort of attempt to maintain a high level of attention over time will achieve the same result as the sudden <clears throat> of the crisis, or a vivid enough imaginative experience of what the crisis would induce in itself so mm -hmm. we talked about earlier when he was 16 or 17 and you know he was going to commit suicide and a minute before drinking the, the acid he realized what it would feel like to have it and how stupid he would have been yeah. i mean if you know tolstoy you know Anna Karenina, as he throws herself on the train the first thing she, what is the first thing she thinks oh, this is a mistake <laughs> so <laughs> this is what you know he, he he had there without having to throw himself on the train uh and so if you can use your imagination to do that, and one of the things I've carried over from Colin's work into work of my own in a book of mine called Lost Knowledge of the Imagination is his definition of imagination, which is a faculty to grasp realities that are not immediately present. So it's a faculty for making things real. It isn't a faculty for make-believe or a, a substitute for reality. It's actually a power to realize things. So he used his imagination – it happened unconsciously to realize what it would happen. You know, what would happen if I did that? Mm -hmm. Had Anna Karenina used her imagination to understand what it would, what she would think when she had thrown herself in front of the train, she wouldn't have done it and so on and so on. And so we have this power to kind of create reality and, and but not in this shallow sense of, you know, I, I want a car or, you know, I, I deserve prosperity, not in that kind of sense. We create reality in the sense that we make real the reality around us all the time. This is one of the things he has this, this idea, what he calls the indifference threshold. And again, this is, this is tied in with the robot. The indifference threshold is this level um, where we take things for granted. Mm -hmm. And, um, and some people it's very low. Most of us it's rather, it's, 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 it's rather high. We, we take a lot of, we take most things for granted. Uh, and the only thing that sort of lowers that is some kind of shock, is some kind of crisis, is some kind of sudden threat to our freedom. And again, Colin died in 2013. And in fact, just earlier this month. So it's, it's, it's his five, um, five year anniversary of, of, of his death. He died in, uh, December 5th, I think, or 6th, um, in 2013. But, um, there was a memorial service for him, um, you know, uh, in, in the following year at, uh, St. James Church in Piccadilly, which in London is a, is a very well known place for alternative kind of events. People like Rupert Sheldrake and Matthew Fox and, and lots of other people have, have spoken there. Colin's spoken there himself. And one of the last times I saw him, uh, I saw him speak there. And I had five minutes to say something about, about his work, um, uh, which is, you know, the equivalent of trying to talk about it uh, now on, in, in one one interview, but um, what I did was talk about what he talks about in the very beginning of the occult, which is the first book of his I read, and he talks about all his work is focused on what he calls the paradoxical nature of freedom, mm -hmm. and that's tied in with the robot and the yeah. indifference threshold, and fundamentally, it's this you know what we all know in this kind of homely kind of way is that you know we when when we have something and we feel safe, you know, in its possession, we tend to take it for granted. And its importance, its meaning starts to dwindle. But once it's threatened, we realize how important it is and we fight for it and we want it. And this is what crisis does. Crisis, it, it, it pushes aside this indifference threshold. And, um, but this is something it's, and most of us would say, well, human nature is like that. You know, uh, we, we, we you, people are just like that. You know, you don't know what you've got till it's gone and all that kind of thing. And sadly, this is true. Mm -hmm. Um, but the thing is we, <laughs> there's a possibility of not have that having yeah. to be the case. If, if I may, Gary, let me just share a story with you, a personal one. Mm. Uh, 
when I interviewed him back in the 1980s, I had had an event like that shortly before the interview. And uh, in preparation for our interview, I listened to that one. So uh, mm -hmm. it's it's fresh in my mind. I was riding my bicycle in San Rafael, California, where I lived, and I got hit. I got rear-ended by a truck. A truck driver didn't see me. And my bicycle was totaled. It was destroyed. But for some reason... Uh, I must have gone like through a somersault or something. I landed on my feet and I was fine. But when I looked at my bicycle, I realized I could have been killed. Mm -hmm. And uh, from that moment forward, at least for quite a long time, and every time I think about it, although it fades, but I mm -hmm. began to appreciate, you know, how precious it is just to be alive. Oh, well, absolutely. I mean, again, again, it sounds like a cliche, but it's it's true, and all the best cliches are true. And this is fundamentally what Colin is is talking about. He 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 loves to quote um, this phrase from the English writer G.K. Chesterton, who talks about um, something he called absurd good news, um, sort of this glad tidings. And the reason it's absurd good news is that it's not really news. You know, it's mm -hmm. at the, it's, you're reminded of what you already know, but you know it, as I say, you know it in, in quotation marks, or you know it in italics, or you know it in this kind of, uh, I guess in the mystical sense, we would call it a gnosis. It's a very immediate, direct kind of thing. But it's, it's, again, it's this thing that he calls faculty X, and it's, it's, um, so many of the people he talks about. They have this mystical experience, and the content of the mystical experience is exactly the same as the content of everyday experience, except they're seeing it in a different way. And this is slightly different. This is something that Kathleen Rain, the poet and, and Blake scholar, who I've, I've written about um, in, in other contexts, she says, um, imagination doesn't see different things. It sees things differently. And again, it's as you say, it's a kind of slight shift. This is something that we – and I, I think it's true. I think Colin is true. Uh, I, I think we can – learn how to induce it or at least learn how to prepare you know the ground for these sort of things to happen and on the simplest level it is kind of developing um, um, uh, an attitude of gratitude my god that sounds horribly <laughs> but, but, but but it is true I mean in, in the sense that yeah. if you stop to think you know we have so many things that I mean, especially us. Here we are, you know, through the miracle of the internet, and we, you know, we each live lives that people of, you know, 100 years ago couldn't even possibly uh, conceive. And for all the things that are horrible in our world, and there are enough of them for us to worry about, at the same time, we have enormous capabilities around us that, you know, another time uh, people would not be um, uh, even aware of. So, mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to sort of end on a note of like we should be thankful for everything around us and all that kind of thing. But in many ways, that's true. But it's not just sort of being thankful. It's understanding what's the process taking place in us, in our minds, you know, uh, that allows for this our grasp on something that we know to be important, and meaningful to us. You know, it, it it weakens in this kind of thing. You know, okay, this is why um, these outsiders threw themselves into these, you know, uh, many times absurd and dangerous situations because th they had an instinctive sense that the the difficult circumstances they put themselves in would make that happen, yeah. you know, involuntarily. Now, again, this is what Colin said. Can we try and make that happen ourselves? And he tells a story about um, one New Year's Eve in the late 70s when he was uh, um, giving a talk somewhere at an alternative you know, school. Um, and there was a you know, tremendous snowfall um, that night. And he was trying to get back home. And it was impossible mm. uh, to get out, and you know, and um, and at some point they decided we have to try. And he tells a story about, you know, they dug, dug, dug all the snow out, and his car was the only one that could get any traction and could, you know, get on the road and get going. And he says though, when he got going, the snowfall was so bad that he couldn't tell, you know, where the road ended and where the ditch was. Uh, and if you know these roads in England, they're not. <laughs> You know, it's not the 101 in California. It's these narrow, narrow roads where you usually have to kind of really go out of your way to let the other car go by. And so you imagine this is just all flat with snow. And he said, you know, he realized that, okay, he had to maintain his attention the whole time in order to get, you know, to get through. And he did that for some time, a couple hours or something, until he finally got to the main road because he had to drive very slow. And when he finally got to the main road and he kind of could relax, he realized that everything around him just suddenly seemed – more clear, more vivid, more there, more present, whatever word you want to use. And it was the same kind of effect that a peak experience would induce or, you know, a, 
a mild uh, dose of mescaline or something like that. In fact, when I when I met him in 1983, I, I remember sitting outside of uh, their home in Cornwall uh, in the summer and him telling me that you know if, if if he made the effort, he could induce you know similar effects to what you know, Aldous Huxley described in 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 um, uh, Doors of Perception. And I, I I believe I believe it's true and not not you know not the kind of full on experience because actually Colin wasn't interested that's the other thing he wasn't interested in the kind of cosmic consciousness sort of thing uh, not that he didn't understand that was important but he thought that was too far on mm. we, we, we can't make any use of that this is again this is what links him to Gurdjieff because Gurdjieff he, Gurdjieff knows about that but he doesn't talk he talks about self-remembering he talks about overcoming our mechanicalness he talks about overcoming our sleep and he's not talking about whatever you know going off into these ecstatic adventures and yeah they're fine and dandy they tell us that there's something more than what we usually accept as for reality. But what we need to do is be able to work our way up to them. And uh, this is something that Colin accepted too. So he's, he, he, he talks about a kind of levels. And again, this is, these are just metaphors that he uses in his writing. It's not sort of the systematic he's – not, he's not a systematic writer in that sense. He's a writer. And the other thing too, so uh, he writes about lots of other things. We haven't even touched on his crime writing. He wrote many, many books about crime yeah. and things like that, or, or his novels, you know, the science mm-hmm. fiction like The Mind Parasites and Philosopher's Stone and things of that sort. Nor his um, books about sex. Or his, but yeah, sex was a sensual kind of thing. I mean, yeah. he wasn't that interested in drugs. He liked he liked wine. That was his uh, drug of choice. He wrote a book about wine. But sex was something that was very, very interested to him. And again, not in this kind of Don Juan sort of way. Um, he wasn't like Henry Miller. He wasn't sort of you know chasing women all the time. He was he was faithful to his wife Joy for you know God you know years and you know decades. He even complains when he was younger, when he still had his fame, that he was committed to her, that he couldn't take advantage of you know all the opportunities that were presented to him and all this sort of thing. But what happens in sex? Sex to him is it's 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 ninety nine percent imagination. Um, and, and he doesn't mean necessarily all the fantasies. He said it's it's even though it's it's co- obviously connected to physical organs, uh, it's very different than um, other hungers like thirst or you know or, or actual hunger for food. And in the simple way that if we're thirsty, no matter how much we can imagine a cool drink of water, it's only going to make our thirst worse. And likewise, if we're hungry, no matter how much we imagine a meal, uh, again, it, it can whet our appetite, but it can't satisfy it. But for better or worse, if we are sexually hungry, we can imagine a satisfactory encounter and actually have the physical response to it that you know would satisfy us. Now, we consider masturbation one of our lower activities, and yes, morally and ethically perhaps, but in terms of showing the power of the imagination, it's actually one of the most important ones because they said with no other kind of human appetite can it be satisfied through the mind alone and and even colin writes and he's not the only one people like rousseau and even contemporary uh, philosophers like the late jacques derrida even wrote a book um, talking about how in many ways masturbation is you know more enjoyable or satisfactory than than you know real sex and all this kind of thing so i mean colin, colin was you know incorrigibly analytic and he was trying to understand like what actually happens and one of the things that he talks about in terms of sex it was really interesting is this kind of response where it, it, it this is in one of his novels it's a novel called ritual in the dark and there's a scene where the main character which is kind of his alter ego and uh this uh girl he's involved with they've They've been in his basement flat and they've, they've made love and all that and they're sated and all this kind of thing. And uh, he goes out um, to get the milk. This is again back in the 50s when you know milk was delivered. <laughs> it's in another world. But he goes out to get the milk and, as, and it's a basement flat. And as he walks by, as, as he gets the milk, he sees a woman walk by and he has a quick sort of you know, view of her skirt. And even though he's just spent the afternoon making love with his girlfriend and believed that he was completely satisfied, has a sudden, you know, sexual interest in just this, you know, anonymous woman walking by. And this leads Colin to say, well, it it isn't the actual sex per se that's the trigger. It's this kind of forbiddenness. It's this, it's this strangeness, you know, this newness, this freshness. Mm -hmm. This is, this is what leads to the Don Juan and the Casanovas. Because what they're really after is that sense of freshness and newness. Mm -hmm. It's a peak experience. I mean, um, I, I don't know how it is with women, and I can only talk about my own male sexuality, and obviously it goes without saying that the only thing Colin can write about in his books is about his own male sexuality. But there is something about men that are attracted to women, and an attractive woman walks by, it kind of triggers a mini immediate peak experience in the sense that suddenly, ooh, so there's something interesting. And it's not 
I mean, we poor men are aff- afflicted with this. You know, we we don't ask for this. This is the this unconscious life force that you know is is just pushing us to do its bidding and what Colin wants to do and other people like Bernard Shaw and uh, his heroes. They want to okay, look, let's make a deal. Let me understand what you want me to do, and then I'll I'll do it consciously. You know, with you, I, I don't want to be pushed around anymore. So he's trying to understand um, the the sexual impulse through this, and this is something that again I mentioned Bernard Shaw. Bernard Shaw was an enormous influence on on Colin. I don't know. If he's read as much these days as he was in the last century, but he's the English, you know, um, playwright, uh, uh, man in Superman, and well, I guess people know him through uh, My Fair Lady, which is really Pygmalion. You know, the, yeah. the film My Fair Lady was, you know, was made out of his play Pygmalion. Uh, but Shaw was another sort of very analytical kind of character, although he had an immense sense of humor. But he he tried to understand this whole male sex drive. This whole he believed in this evolutionary drive that he called the life force and he mm-hmm. borrowed that from Henri Bergson, the Elan Vital. And it's this kind of purpose of urge to grow. It's it's not the Darwinian just, you know, uh, cause and effect, um, you know, survival of the fittest kind of thing. It, it's this kind of unconscious urge to grow, which we are trying to understand. <laughs> We're trying to understand it and 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 you know sort of make clear its its conscious purposes. And one of the things it 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 does, it it, it uses sex in some way to somehow transform consciousness this is fundamentally what colin comes down to what sex is fundamentally about is about transforming consciousness and again he's not talking about it in tantra and all that kind of stuff even though he talks about that it's what he calls the origin of the sexual impulse this is what he's trying mm-hmm. to sort of map out he points out for example that uh, uh whereas having sex is one of the more animalistic things that that we do for humans it's very different than for other animals well, he, this is something that he learned from Robert Ardrey, um, who wrote Territorial Imperative and African Genesis. You know, these were big books back in the back in the sixties and seventies. But he said that actually sex is a sideshow in the animal world. Again, we talk about you know, oh, he's a sexual, oh, he's such an animal. But actually, you know, sex is actually a rather small thing. It's survival, it's food, dominance. Uh, so in human beings, it's sex is. It's nothing animal. In fact, the way humans have sex has got nothing to do with the way animals do. We, when we think about it being animal, that's a, a kind of fetish that we use to stimulate our imagination to sort of, you know, us to get into it. But no animal goes out of its way to have sex in the way, or the ones that do are the ones that are in captivity. If, if you're, you're in, un, you know, in unnatural in habitat, and this was something that Maslow studied. Maslow studied the behavior of apes in the zoo uh or you know and yeah and and he he thought oh um actually there's a lot of sex going on but he realized that it wasn't the sex per se it was dominance the sex was a way of establishing dominance so you know the um even you know some male apes or monkeys would sort of submit ritually to another male in order to establish dominance not actually to have you know have sex and that kind of thing so again this was something that wilson picked up too with a lot of sex is less to do with the actual sex then it has to do with this kind of will to power mm-hmm. sort of thing. And again, that ties into this kind of sense of increased consciousness. Again, it, sound, it doesn't sound like, well, that doesn't sound like consciousness. That's very spiritual. But that, that Wilson isn't really talking about spiritual. He's actually talking about this kind of intensity, this kind mm-hmm. of intensity of consciousness that, you know, we know in most people's lives, sex is probably the most intense kind of experience mm-hmm. they have. You know, this is something that, uh, and um, for better or worse, this is something there. And so that kind of energy, is available to us it's there but in most of us sex is the only thing that kind of releases it or triggers mm-hmm. it but what wilson argues is that in some people the outsiders other people maybe some of you know our viewers and ourselves we we're also very get excited about ideas we get excited about other things that are other more purely imaginative kinds of things sex is a kind of halfway house because it's physical you know uh, but the, the, and we all know you know the physical side of it isn't the only thing. You know, if, if you're not into it, as it were, it, it, the sex isn't going to happen. You, your mind, in the sense of your imagination, has to be involved in some way. And that doesn't mean having fantasies. It means actually informing the reality that you're involved with at the time. And this is true of all of our experience. Mm-hmm. Um, and But what Colin is saying is that, you know, for some people, the kind of intensity that's triggered by a sexual experience or the, or the possibility of one can also be triggered by mm-hmm. imaginative kinds of things, you know, yeah. by ideas, by you know, art, by books, by all this kind of thing. And this is his way of saying that increasingly what 
our evolution is about is about being able to occupy this inner world um relying less and less on stimulus from from the outer world. And this is one of the things he got very, very interested in was the whole sort of black room experience or the sensory deprivation experience. Uh, and he even wrote a novel. It's a spy novel. One of the things he does is he takes kind of genres, spy, even erotic novels or science fiction or um, horror, you know, sort of horror, detective, horror. all this kind of thing. Yeah. He uses these genres and then he's able to tell the story. He entertains the reader, but he's able to communicate mm-hmm. his ideas as he goes across. And one of the most important ones, a book just called The Black Room. And it's precisely about, I mean, the plot is about these spies trying to learn a way to overcome uh, being trapped in a you know completely black room, a sensory deprivation chamber, so that they're not worn down and you know can talk and all this kind of thing. And there's different characters who go in and you know they succumb to it for different reasons at different lengths of time. But there's one character. This is usually a, a a Colin Wilson alter ego who's the guy who knows how to use his mind and consciousness, and he's able to go in and he's able to defeat the black room because he's able to somehow develop his inner muscles enough that he can hold on to his sense of inner purpose. Um, without having to have stimuli from mm. from the outer world, and Wilson would say this is something we've been trying to do from day one. Mm-hmm. You know, it's something we've been trying to do when we first kind of crawled out of the ocean way yeah. back when. And you know, he he does see some kind of enormous future, you know, down the line where we actually have you know much more power over our minds than than we can even you know think of today. Well, that's uh, one of the most exciting aspects of uh, Colin Wilson. Well, Gary, uh, this has been a real pleasure. I know we could keep talking all day. Uh, I could do it all day. Uh, and I'm sure you can because it's very clear to me that uh, you are you have picked up the mantle from well, Colin I mean, Wilson. I, I have to say I've gone out of my way to do it. I, I said ever since I first read that book, I, I – um, uh, I just been following everything mm-hmm. he's written and written about him in in many different places and um, went to bat for him here while yeah. he was still alive and publishing books and writing reviews for him for some of the newspapers in London and all that and um, I, over the years I've come to know um, his family very well his wife Joy and his children and uh, you know it's 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 uh, something very special mm-hmm. and um, I only what I would hope from this conversation and from anything I've done is for people who don't know his work. Uh, to you know, find out about it and, and seek it out because it's definitely, definitely mm-hmm. you'll get something out of it. And for the people who do, to you know, go back and reread it. And I think his ideas deserve um, much more recognition than than, than they've got. Mm-hmm. So let, let's hope this is something that can get that going. To my way of thinking, he's really uh, one of the most important thinkers of the 20th century. I can't agree with you more. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing uh, this time with me, Gary, and I look forward to many more conversations with you. Same here. Absolutely a pleasure. Mm-hmm.